Judy Scott, I'm the library director. Thank you for coming this evening. And um, I have Helen Connor, the author of uh, two books, Do the Artfish Can't Climb Trees and Learning Without Tears. Um, and basically, she's developed the Mercury model, which helps you identify your learning style and the way that you communicate your unique, the unique way your brain works. So she's going to talk about that tonight and then have a book signing at the end. Great. So thank you, Cindy. Helen. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you all for, for coming as well. Um, <laughs> I guess what you, what you came for was to hear more about me, to hear more about my books, to find out what this is all about, especially the term uh, unique mental strengths. Um, you may be asking yourself, well, do I have unique mental strengths? And I'm here to say resoundingly, yes, you do, even if they've been buried for years. <laughs> even if they've been buried for years. Even if you cast them aside when you were three in favor of different mental strengths that you didn't connect with very well. Um, the others are still there. And as part of my work, I uncover them for people and say, hey, look at this. <laughs> so, um, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and I'll swing on into the Mercury model, which I've been researching for decades. It's, um, it's really a long-term research project, and it's ongoing. Uh, I've pr I, I can truly say that most of the things in my life that have been really worth learning, I've learned in New Hampshire. Um, I, was, I was very lucky that my family bought property in Wolfboro when I was seven, um, over on the far side of Lake Wentworth on the uh, Sanbenville side of the lake. And um, given how old I am, I've probably been in Wolfboro longer than most of you, <laughs> if I started at seven. Um, I went to UNH. I studied chemistry at UNH. I stayed on for an additional few years and earned a master's degree in nuclear and radiochemistry. And then I went off to Boston to put all that education to work. And I had a triple appointment between Mass General Hospital, uh, Children's Hospital, and the MIT Nuclear Research Reactor, which is where I made radiopharmaceuticals. That is, a drug with a little piece in it that's radioactive to be used in scans at Children's Hospital and Mass General Hospital. And that was, uh, that was very interesting. And I think if I, had, if I had stayed in that field, I would probably be a wealthy woman. That didn't happen. <laughs> that didn't happen particularly because um, it became evident to me that in order for a person to heal and return to a state of well-being, it isn't sufficient to have the treatment coming from the outside in. And it, as soon as it was really evident to me that people need to undergo a significant change within themselves in order to participate in their own healing process, then I, I really had to leave the field of nuclear medicine because all the nuclear reactors in the country won't heal anyone unless there's a participation. That got me looking at the subtle energies, the things, those forces and those energies that um, underpin everything that we see, everything that's evident. And I started off on the right track to do that because you can't see protons and electrons and neutrinos and any of the other subatomic particles, but they'll kill you as soon as look at you if you don't treat them with great respect. And I think that's true of many of the subtle energies. Um, so I looked at um, the link between the physical body, the emotions, the mind, the spirit, 
and how we actually are the composite of all of those components of ourselves. Um, so I looked at, at other pursuits, and this is the result of one of them. I realized that we really think and learn differently, one from another. My mind doesn't work like your mind. Your mind doesn't work like her mind. Our minds are very individual, and what we need in order to learn is individual, and how we speak and how we communicate, it's, it's all individual. Um, I think Albert Einstein really said it all, and you might wonder why I've called my book Fish Can't Climb Trees. It's what, what Albert Einstein said was, we are all geniuses. Easy for him to say, right? We are all geniuses, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its entire life believing that it's stupid. That's a very strong, insightful statement. And I believe it to be entirely true. These animals that you'll see on the poster are the same ones that you see over on my Mercury model poster. And each of those represents a way of dealing with information, a way of approaching it, taking it in, storing it, speaking it out, remembering it, forgetting it. Um, there are, in the Mercury model, 12 different primary learning tones or learning styles, 12 primary ways of interacting with information. And there are very few of them that know how to climb a tree. <laughs> you know. The thing, about, the thing about a fish is it may not be able to climb a tree, but I certainly can't do underwater breathing as well as just your average even minnow. You know, um, we do have different mental strengths. So I started developing the Mercury model as a team building tool. Somewhere along the way between MIT and current, um, I, went, I, I owned a bookshop in Portsmouth that needed some decisions made about which direction I was going to take it in. And um, I went to England because I figured I could at least understand the language. Ha. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I met a man there and fell in love and got married. But um, so the team building tool that I was developing was for English business up in the, the north where it's, it's, um, it's living in the last century. I think that's the way to put it. They aren't really doing agriculture with horses, but that's the way it is. Everything's very old-fashioned. Um, so to, to try to launch something about individuality of, of mental dynamics in a place like that was really quite interesting. And it was almost exclusively women business owners who hired me to come in. Um, and it's really always been that way. Um, there are loads of theories as to why. <laughs> we probably each have our own. Um, but it, it became clear that understanding the mental dynamics of the team of people that you were working with was extremely helpful for the well-being of the company and extremely helpful for their bottom line profits. Um, it's, it's the distance between one person's mouth and the other person's ears. You know, it's one person's presentation and another person's comprehension. That if, if nothing is done in order to try to foster communication based on the truth of each individual mind, then it really doesn't happen and there's misunderstandings, miscommunications, judgment. It's about judging someone because they can't climb a tree. 
You know, it's like judging someone because they seem to be more perceptive than you are. They always get it, and you need to go over it a few times. Or you might be one of the visuals of the world. Visuals, and four of, the, four of those learning styles that are represented there are primarily visual people who do not get it by the, read, the oral word, the, the printed word. They don't get it by talking about it. They only get it by looking at pictures. Um, It's true. It's true. So I started it as a team building tool, and it was really well received, particularly among women business owners. And it it bring great b benefit to um, to business people. And I kept researching and researching and interviewing and talking about it, and I finally said, "Wait a minute, I've got to get this message out." further, you know, beyond the confines of business and um, teams. And I thought, since it was all in my mind already, I should just write a book. And the first one that I wrote, Learning Without Tears, and I wrote that for parents, particularly, about children. I had it in my mind that parents particularly wanted to give a helping hand to their child's education, um, that they particularly wanted to know what was going on behind those eyes. Um, and that's why I wrote a book for, for parents about their children. And it, it um, treats each child's mind as, as a very precious little gem uh, that can be nurtured along according to its own needs, not the parents' needs. And I think actually I'd like to, to insert here some of the parameters of the Mercury model. Um, one is there are 12 learning styles. One is you're born with this, and it does not change over time. It doesn't go away. One is that we all do best what comes naturally. And although your own mental strengths are a natural group of items within your particular learning style, some people abandon their own strengths and pick up on the learning dynamics that they're encouraged to follow which could be on the part of a parent. It could be a particularly inspiring teacher. It could be um, their friend's mother. Um, when, they, when someone says to a child, no, 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 you're doing it all wrong. Here, I've got it so sussed out in my own head. I'll show you how to do this. And it could be Aunt Sadie, you know, but the child says, Aunt Sadie's way of doing things mentally is better than mine. I better follow what she says. And that's right there when a person's apt to disconnect from their greatest strengths. And that's a large part of what I do is help people reconnect with what's the best within them. Um, there's a, one primary tone that your mind resonates with. And most people have at least a few, what I call subtones. And subtones are other voices that speak in your head. And sometimes they conflict with your primary tone. And other times they support it. And that just depends. Um, sometimes you can have as much conflict inside your head, things like, Shall I do it the traditional way? Or do I want to go off on my own and do it in an unconventional way? Or should I obey the rules? Or should I just feel what's happening here? That kind of thing. So if your primary tone is one of them, 
um, your subtones may, may or may not connect with them, just like other people do. <laughs> One of the things about working with business people is that I had the opportunity to observe what happens in a company when people are recruited because they're easy to speak to and easy to get along with. Um, and you end up with three or four people in the high management level who all think exactly alike, which means they can communicate very, very easily. And they all share the same blind spots, which means there's nobody there representing any point of view other than the one they share. Um, and it's, uh, I've seen more businesses go under because they couldn't move with the times. They couldn't get out of their own way, really. I'll tell you a child story that I particularly like, and it's, it stood at the, at the interface between my two books. Um, I had a very good friend in England who ran what's called a behavior unit. And it was um, within but beside what we would call a high school. They would call it a secondary modern or a comprehensive. Anything except a high school because that sounds American. Mm -hmm. And um, English people try very hard to not sound like Americans. <laughs> um, any child who was misbehaving in the classroom and disrupting other children and annoying the teacher was excluded from the classroom and sent to the behavior unit where they stayed until something else happened. Now, I, I probably should know the figures in the United States, but I don't. And I do know that last year in the UK, 300,000 young people were excluded either from the classroom or from the school altogether. That's 300,000 destroyed lives. Because once you're out of the classroom in the UK, you never get back in, really. Um, and that's 300,000 members of the future generation who are supposed to be moving the society forward. I think it's just awful. And those children were considered to be unteachable. And therefore, it didn't matter. So they were out in the cold. Well, my friend who ran the behavior unit was using my book to look up the learning requirements and the learning needs and the learning strengths of each of the children that came into the behavior unit. And he, he, he was absolutely stunned because there wasn't anyone, there wasn't any child there, or adolescent, I should say, who, um, who didn't respond positively. And many of them were able to rejoin the classroom. And he said, these children aren't unteachable. They're unreachable by the teaching methods to which they're being subjected. And his point of view, and I think it's a very good one, is that if, if a mind isn't engaged in the classroom, it goes truant and it starts misbehaving. It's bored, it's unhappy. And the reason that most of those children misbehave is because they're not being reached by the, the method. So he brought back to me all, I mean, dozens and dozens of stories that touched me so deeply. There was one little lad, 14 years old. Well, he's not a little lad, is he? He's a, an adolescent. He was an adolescent who had never read anything. He'd never read a book. He'd never read a newspaper. He'd never read a comic strip. He'd never read anything. Um, And it took, he had a reading age at the age of 14. He had a reading age of about six, <laughs> about six. However, he, there was a strange thing about this young man because he had a phenomenal 
relationship with mathematics. Phenomenal. But none of the teachers knew what to do with that, so they didn't do anything with it. And it just kind of went underground. Um, it took the, the teacher in the behavior unit something like three months to bring, bring that child fully around. And his, and, and this man's an educational professional, so he knows about reading ages and testing them. And he retested this boy, and it, he had gained eight years of reading age in three months. Now, this, is, this isn't a change in his intellect or his capabilities. It's a change in what was going in and what was coming out. And when he was approached through his own learning requirements, everything he needed was, was right there. Um, and he went back into the classroom, and not only did th that, but he went on to secondary education beyond that. Um, I'm cutting the story really short for the obvious reasons, but um, it touched me so deeply and all the other children in that situation. And that's why I wrote the second book, really. Because I, this was for parents about their children. It was a long way away from a 14-year-old. So I updated the whole idea of individual learning styles by writing the profiles for each of the 12 of them in the first person. So instead of the author talking to a parent about their child, we have the mind itself saying, here's how I work. Here's what I do. Here's what's going on in here. Here's what I'm interested in. Here's what you can do to help me. Here's what I think I look like to the outside world, but I may be wrong. Um, and it's a, it's a huge, it's, it's, it's like very assertive. It grabs you by the jugular. And each, each personal learning style of the 12 of them um, is accompanied by quite a lot of stories about married couples. And I have, now I, I can tell you this story. This is a very secretive learning style. Its name is Sherlock the Detective. And it, it hides, it, in my book I say, he says, he, Sherlock, says, when you look at me, you will see the defensiveness way before you see my sensitivity. And it's, it's, it's so very true. It, it's, it hides because it is so sensitive that it just wants to creep away. And it's a person who actually feels interrogated if you ask, did you have a good night's sleep? Or what do you want for lunch? <laughs> and it's very, very private. Well, that was, the, that was the, the woman. Her marriage, her fiance, her fiance was this one, which I call Procon, the diplomat. And you can see that those two birds are in relationship to each other. And it's a, it's a learning style in which a person learns by discussing, debating, talking it over. That's the classic of I want to study with a friend. You know, wants to look at everything from multiple points of view and try them out and get the, get the picture of it. So that was the fiance. She. Sherlock, the, the detective, um, she thought it really wasn't a, an, of any concern to her fiancé if she changed their bank account from one bank to, a, to another. She actually forgot to tell him. She didn't forget. She didn't think it was any, any of any concern because she was running the finance of, in the couple. Um, she often would neglect to tell him when she wasn't coming home for dinner, which he would be making. And you can imagine, he was, he was waiting there to talk about the day. What did you do today, dear? Um, I could go on and on. 
he decided she was having an affair. It was the only logical, and this is logical if nothing else, um, it was the only logical explanation of her behavior is that she was having an affair. And he, before the wedding, decided she, he better confront her on this. And she laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. And years later, he still hadn't seen the funny side. <laughs> That's the kind of thing. I'll tell you another story. Um, <clears throat> This is Steady the Vault. And I don't know if where you're sitting you can see the eyes. Each picture has an eye, and that represents information. And what the character is doing with the, with the eye, in the, as symbolically, represents how, how that mind interacts with information. Well, Steady the Vault is chewing on it. And that's what Steady does. If you give Steady some information, he or she will chew on it and chew on it and chew on it and swallow it. They're not going to change their mind quickly or easily once they've swallowed it. Um, steady is a, a learning style that when, when information is coming at it, it's going like this, <laughs> backing off and saying, not out loud, God forbid, saying, I'm not sure I want this. Just give me some time, and I'll maybe take it in, and maybe I won't. But once it gets chewed up and swallowed, it's in there. It's very, very practical. It learns, this, this learning style learns only by a hands-on application. Don't show him pictures. Don't read it out loud. Don't show him a video or he has to get his hands on it and do it. Okay. That, that was the mother. The child, <laughs> her child was this one, which I call Sponge the Sensitive. Like Sherlock, Sponge the Sensitive is a visual learner who has to filter all incoming information through the feelings on the way in. And if it feels right, it's a good idea. To mother, if, it, if you can make it work in the world, it's a good idea. So this child, when having difficulty with homework, would, would initially go and say to his mother, could you help me with my homework? And she was absolutely over the moon, really felt needed and, you know, honored to, to be asked. And they would sit down at the table together, and she would start in with her unbelievably practical approach. <laughs> and the child's eyes would glaze, glaze over in about two minutes, and he'd say, Mom, thanks anyway and he'd have to get up and leave. And it, it just broke her heart time after time after time until I explained to her what was going on. So it's, there, are, there are two cases where, the, in a non-business sense, family sense, individual relationship sense, the Mercury model has really solved some, solved some problems. What did the mom do after, after that revelation? She, um, she found videos that dealt with whatever topic it was that was being taught in his classroom. Or they'd go to a museum or a painting shop or turn on the television and, well, now they're searching YouTube. Um, but it, it really worked very well and they've, they really understand each other now. And that was a few years ago, so they're, they're growing up with their differences. There are, there are some combinations that are more difficult than others. Some are terribly difficult. It's about common ground as to whether it's possible to, well, it's always possible to resolve once you know it, once you know it.
I mentioned the word learning requirements. That requires practicality. It requires hands-on application. This one requires, this one and two others on the board here, that one requires a feeling of safety. There are three learning styles there. Sherlock, who I said is sensitive, but you just don't see it. You see the bristly defensiveness. And Sponge and Sonar, the intuitive. Those three comprise what I call the water family. And every one of them needs to feel safe in order to learn. If they don't feel safe, the shutters come down and they can't learn anything. Um, good example of that one, there was a, I do, I do workshops on this topic that really bring the material to life. Even if you've read the book, the, it, it really comes to life because we act it all out. But there was a woman in the, in the group who was a school inspector thick into the educational field. And she heard me describing her learning style, which was sponge the sensitive, and, and how difficult it is if there's not safety in, in the home or in the classroom or somewhere. And she sat there with her mouth in a little O. <laughs> and she, she, was, she said, Helen, when, when my family moved when I was about 10, from a little town with a little school into a city. I didn't learn anything for a year and a half. I was so frightened. And it's true. It's a group of people who need soft colors and no noise and peace and comfort and security. As opposed to, I mean, look at this one. Can you see that he, it's sort of lunging onto a piece of information? And where's, and this one? This one's called Flash the Pioneer, and this one is called Scout the Trailblazer. And the, every spoke in his bicycle wheel is, is one of these little eyes. Those, they are the fastest moving. They are the ones with the hand in the air first, and they actually mean it. You know? um, they are, they are so rapid, they're, they're, they're minds that grab onto new information instantly and, and just breathe it in as fully developed concepts. They don't have to do anything with it. They don't have to analyze it. They don't have to pass it through their feelings. And I know a number of mothers whose young sons are this kind of learning, and they had such a bad time in the classroom. The one who is, is that one, the teacher was so totally freaked out by his energy level, you know, bouncing off the walls, that she made him sit with the remedial children. And he sank into, there's something seriously wrong with me. You know, I'm, I'm not all right. I wouldn't be sitting here with these remedial children if I were all right and he sank into himself further and further and further. It took him years to get through the depression that he tum tumbled into because his, his classroom teacher didn't understand it. And his mother heard the teacher's words and said, she must be right, she's a teacher. Well, he's, he's okay now, but he's in his early 30s now, and he went to university and did very well. So he did come around all right. But they are so vibrant. <laughs> and for goodness sakes, what's a person to do with one of those and one of those in the same classroom? But it's once everyone knows what's going on, it's much easier to deal with. And it takes no time at all to, to, to get there. I have. There are four families of three signs each, three families of four signs each, and one family where there are six signs each. Although these are very different, they have something and they have common ground. If, if there were two of, any two or three of these would have a common, common bond with each other. 
And it's that um, they're all reflective and they're all absorptive, all three of them. They're, they're all the learning styles that need pictures. And if they don't, if you don't give them the advantage of giving them a picture about what you're talking, they have to create something out here somewhere. They translate your words into a visual image, and then they take in, they absorb the image they've created. But if you give them a picture to begin with, they're going to get it much more easily. No. So if you're any of the other learning styles and you're in partnership with one of these, be it your, your social partner, your marriage partner, your business partner, your child, then looking around back behind what their learning requirements are gives you an inside route to how to shape up your message, right? To shape up your message in order that um, the other person can get it. Instead of just using your mouth the way you usually do, you do them the service of presenting the information the way they need it. Okay. That's what I mean about the distance between your mouth and the other person's ears. You know? And if you've got a, a, a child who needs peace and safety and quiet in order to learn anything, for goodness sake, provide it. I'm quite convinced that one presentation never will reach everybody. Oh, I agree. I think that there needs to be um, parts of the day or parts of each lecture or different assignments. If, if those two learning styles were enlisted to help the teacher, run down to the corner shop for me and bring some chalk or pass these papers out or anything to get them up and moving, because those two, and really this one as well, Rex the Dignified, can't learn if they're s sitting at a desk with their fingers crossed and looking tidy. You know, they can't. Everything comes down for them. So some need the safety, some need the motion, the movement. Mm -hmm. And a clever way of putting that together can work beautifully but it's going to be different from what was studied in teacher ed. What have I missed? I've missed the air signs altogether. That's Buzz the Curious. You can see that <laughs> it, it's hovering over the information rather than landing on it. Um, and Procon and Bothan, the innovative. Those three belong to a family grouping that I call the air sign, and they learn by fitting incoming information into concepts. That's all they have to do to get it. They fit it into a concept. They have to get the sense of it. Um, to, to those minds, any new idea is a good idea. It doesn't have to be true. <laughs> doesn't need to be false, but um, as long as it's new, they're happy with it and they can fit it into a concept. So they're pretty fast on the uptake too. Those three are the only minds of the entire 12 that um, can learn from the written word or the spoken word. So with all this blackboard board stuff and teachers speaking and so forth, that's why I wanted to get you all up and active, <laughs> you know, because some of you are, will go to sleep if you sit too long. Um, but they're the only three out of the 12 who learn from the written or the spoken word. Isn't that amazing? But this one in particular, um, a, a lot of teachers, classroom teachers have, have that. And they believe in their heart of hearts in the Socratic method of discussion and talking things through. Um, so those, those three, this one, this one is, is very curious. It buzzes around like mad. And in fact, it, it is naturally the kind of mind that leaps from one topic to another because that's what it thrives on. Unfortunately, many parents 
are become convinced that it's um, ADHD and they medicate these children when in fact this is a absolutely genuine uh, feature of that mind. It's curious. In fact, I, ha I have to uh, I have to read you one of the most perfect examples. I hope I can find it easily. Perfect examples of Buzz the Curious at work. Sponge. This is um, this is one of the stories about. <laughs> I was in the, driving in the car. This woman was driving. I was riding as a passenger. And she said to me, without taking a breath, did I tell you that Tom has become a wellness coach? He's a nice young man. I never would have thought he would want to talk to people about their, their health, their weight, how they look, and how they come across to others. But he does. He does want to do that. And he has started learning the ropes. And Tom needed a haircut. So he went to a lady who has set up her business in the new cattle auction mart. She's just a tiny little room, but all the farmers will find it convenient to have the hair cut there, as they're all there anyway. And I had been thinking about my next 90-day goal for my business, what I could do that is completely a new development, moving in a totally new direction. And I thought about the fact that vets do talks for farmers about animal nutrition, and I could do talks to farmers about their own nutrition, and I could call it why the farmer and his wife got fat while the sows got lean. <laughs> she did. A lot of you know, she did. That's, that's Buzz the Curious. You know, and it's, it's hilarious. It really is. I think, I, think, I think both these books are very funny. You know, I think they're both written with, well, this one is, with a lot of sensitivity about the child, but with a lot of humor. And this, you know, will make you weep as well as laugh. So. And then what about the lion? The lion is, um, the lion has a great deal in common with those two. And they're, they're the one I call the fire family. And they're, they're the ones, well, the, they're the ones who take in information without doing anything to it. They don't need to process it at all. They just, they just take it in, and then they get bored. Those are the people that if there's a business meeting coming up, you don't give them the agenda before they get there. Because given that they love information, they'll read it all before the meeting, and then sit there and be bored to tears for the, for the duration. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we all know those. But Rex the Dignified, um, I love Rex the Dignified. I think he's really quite cute. You know, I, I love the illustration. And um, there's, a, there's another family group. I said, I said that somebody, I think it was Sherlock, no, it was, it was Steady, backs off and says, I don't know if I want this yet. Just hold on. There are four of these learning styles that decide if they're going to take in new information or not. They have checkered school careers because some things they take to and other things they don't take to. And they will not learn something that they don't want to learn. Period. That's it. They won't learn it. Rex the Dignified is one of them. So although he learns very quickly and takes it in, he has this great pause before deciding that he wants it and that he's going to, to have it. Um, he will only take in information that's going to increase his, his sense of his authentic self. He doesn't, ha he doesn't want any drivel. He only wants important things that if he learns them, he can speak them with great authority and with conviction and stick his identity into the presentation. If he can't be proud of it, he doesn't want it. Isn't that interesting? I mean, one of the children in that behavior center had that learning style, 
and he had a habit of ridiculing the teacher in public, you know, in the classroom. And he was sent out of the room because of it. And it became clear to the man running the behavior center that this young, uh, this adolescent felt that the information that was coming from the teacher wasn't good enough. He hadn't put enough of, of himself into it to give it to the students. It wasn't, it didn't measure up. So he wasn't having it. But he wanted to be educated. He was in a real dilemma. So he took it out on the teacher who just sent him away. That got very, very easily resolved. The man running the behavior center just gave the profile to the adolescent, said, go home and read this. And he did. And he came back stunned. He, he got it, just like that. He got it. And he was, uh, he was fined from that point on. You know, we are all so different. We are so different. What about the person that everything has to be precise? Oh, that's details the analyst. <laughs> that's details the analyst. Um, it asks questions. It, it, it takes a sentence and separates it limb from limb, breaks things down into ever smaller bits in order to understand the detail. And that's how that learning style learns. It learns by dissect and learn. Is that the one you mean? Yeah. Yeah. I'm that one. <laughs> a loaded question. And this is not to detect your political alignment or anything, but our president, he's communicating with the public. He is. So what style, he's, 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 <clears throat> he's deliberately talking to a particular style of learning, is, is he not? <clears throat> I've written a, um, a, a, an abbreviated version of his learning style profile and his wife's. And they're posted as a blog on my website. It's very interesting. Our president happens to be Sponge the Sensitive. And you know, that brings up another point about the Mercury model that I had meant to mention, but he's the prime example to allow me to do that. Um, the Mercury model has nothing to do with behavior. It doesn't, it doesn't describe how you look, what people see about you. It only deals with the mind, which is a, quite a hidden realm. Um, what I'm basically doing is looking at the relationship that each one of us has with the mythology of the god of thinking and communicating, the god Mercury, and his mythology, and his story, and, um, and the pure, the pure mercurial energy is, is more like Buzz the sensitive, because um, the, the god Mercury has that, that youthful, fast, um, quick, res re respective kind of thinking or image. So I, I assess how your mind and your mind and my mind funnel the mythology of Mercury into the fabric of the rest of our being. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you how I, that's, that's what I do, but I'll tell you how I do that. And this is, this is the part that's just too stunning to believe. But the point is it actually works. I think that the, the energy of the god Mercury is at a higher energy level than anything that's physical. And as it, as it comes from the realm of pure energy into the earth plane, it comes through the planet Mercury and all the planets because they're the furthest out away from us of anything. So I look at the planet Mercury 
as an indicator of the way your mind is going to color and deal with the mercurial energy of thought. So I've got astronomical tables in both my books for a hundred years. There's a hundred years of tables in each book and you merely look it up. And the thing that makes your mind unique is the possibility of the subtones. But the pr your primary resonance is with the primary tone. And that's what you'd share with everyone else who was born at the same time. <laughs> they, they relate to the connection between the planet Mercury and the other planets at the time of your birth. And sometimes I have to go back and ask a person for their time of birth if it happens to be at a time when Mercury was taking off one costume and putting on the other, you know, on the, on the very day. But all the times are in the book, too. So it's a hundred, a hundred years in each book, but this one stopped in 2014, and this one now goes up to 2025. So this is the earlier, the earlier period, from 1915 to 2014. These three, exec the achiever, you see, who's dressed in a Harris tweed, and steady the vault, and details the analyst, those three are the family I'd call the Earth family, and they're all dead practical. Um, they're all hands-on learners. Um, but this is the one that resists initially. This is the one that throws its little arms open wide to say, more information, please, more information. And exec is the one that moves forward, always forward. There, you can see who else is going to move forward. He's going to move forward. Um, and he's going to move forward. Yeah. Um, so this is, is um, your archetypal suit. You know, business person, person whose mind quite naturally thinks up new business ideas. This is the one that in, would invent it. Boffin, the innovator, is right on the forefront, forefront of new inventions of all sorts, and particularly the electronic sort. However, <laughs> if you had asked me which would be the most, have the most difficulty or the greatest challenge with dealing with IT, I would have said sonar the intuitive, who's the, the poet, the... However, I have uh, one of my business advisors in the UK is Sonar the Intuitive, and I've finally seen what he, his mind likes to unify everything. He makes a terrible mess of a client's office, you know, calling for files on this and notes on that. But he, he goes in and infiltrates every aspect of the computer, the programming, what you want from it, and comes up with, with intuitive decisions about how it works and how to do it. And I, I know a, a woman who's an expert programmer, and she too is so now the, the uh, intuitive. So I think, that, I think that each one of the learning styles can approach the electronic age, but in their own way. They'll do it in their own way. They won't all be logical. Some will be really intuitive. Funny answer, but that's the size of it. I have a workshop, and it's a, it's a day uh, that's totally active. I start out identifying your learning style before the day begins. And throughout the course of the day, you're identifying the family groupings that you belong to, the common ground you have with other people, and so forth. It's, and, and toward the end of it, I dramatize in costume all 12 of the learning styles. 
which belies the behavioral element, I know, but it's like how a mind would behave if it had a behavioral style. So if anyone wants any more information about that, there it is. Glad you came, and I hope you're glad you came, too.